In the words of Barack Obama, <coughs> climate change is no longer some far off problem. It is happening here, it is happening now. Climate change is real. And we know this not just based on the increase in global temperatures across the globe, but also the increase frequency and intensity of wildfires, the retreat and reduction of glaciers. Some areas are becoming drier and more prone to droughts. We all in this room have experienced some form of climate change over the last decade. I'm really interested in how plants and animals will respond to these changes moving forward. I like to think of myself as a conservation paleobiologist. I ask questions that are of direct relevance to conservation, but that use the fossil record to actually answer those questions. So you might wonder uh, why conservation paleobiology? And in particular, uh, the fields of ecology and, and uh, conservation are really important. But if I want to actually study this sloth here, I need to go out in the field and I need to better understand how they're responding to climate change. And if I'm really lucky, I can get one year of support, maybe five years of funding, maybe even 10 years of funding to monitor the population. And if I'm exceptionally lucky, I can set up a team of colleagues to actually go out and assess these populations over many years. But I still have to wait five, 10, or even 100 years to actually assess how these animals are responding to climate change moving forward. But instead, we can actually go back in the fossil record and understand both how these animals have responded to changes in the past and garner some lessons as to how they might respond to changes in the future. We've had periods where we've gone from a glacial to an interglacial period, also when it's gotten drier, and we can use these lessons to better understand it. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the importance of the fossil record, uh, how we study the fossil record, and most importantly, what lessons we can learn and garner from the fossil record that are of direct relevance to conservation today. So these are some of my favorite animals. Here we have a giant bird known as Jenny Ornis, a giant goanna that was potentially even venomous, the marsupial lion, a Tasmanian wolf or tiger. This one actually uh, went extinct in the 1930s. Here we have a giant short-faced kangaroo, which is about my size. And here we have a uh, giant wombat-like animal the size of a rhino. So all of these bizarre animals lived in Australia about 45,000 years ago. And most of them, like most large animals across the globe, went extinct somewhere between 10 and 35,000 years ago. And the big question is why? And so the two reigning hypotheses are climate change or humans. So we've had periods going from sort of a glacial to an interglacial. It's gotten very warm very quickly, and that may have played a role. Alternatively, humans were now on many of these landscapes, and in some places, we have direct evidence of them he uh, hunting and killing these megafauna. It may, in fact, have been some sort of combination of the two, where these animals might have been able to respond to these changes in climate, but humans had already reduced their population numbers or were in the way by fragmenting landscapes, and they were unable to respond positively. But one way we can get at a better answer of not only the causes of these extinctions, but also the consequences, is by studying the fossils themselves. So how do we do that? Well, the sort of traditional way in which we do that is we study the morphology, or the size and the shape of the skulls. So here I have a saber-toothed cat, and I think we can all agree that this thing ate meat. Um, and we can also look at these elongated canines, or sabers, and they were exceptionally effective for slicing open their prey and causing them to bleed out really quickly. They also had these long forearms and very strong forearms that allowed them to sort of restrain their prey. So the idea is that they might have been these sort of ambush hunters. We can also study the chemistry in their teeth and their bones. So you are what you eat. Everything you eat is incorporated into your tissues, including your blood, your skin, your hair, everything, including your teeth and your bones. And the great thing about teeth and bones is that they're uh, fossilized and recorded in the fossil record. So we can actually analyze the teeth of these animals, and what we're able to find is that this picture here of saber-toothed cats taking down bison in this open landscape was probably a fairly rare occurrence. In fact, they were highly specialized on prey from forest environments, and again, likely used a sort of ambush predation to, eat, to, to capture and then eat their prey. We can also study the dental microwear on their teeth, so the microscopic wear patterns that are formed when they are chewing on food. So in carnivores, we can tend to differentiate between something that was eating lots of flesh, perhaps like a cheetah, from something that was eating lots of bone, perhaps like a hyena. And this is really important to understanding their ecology. So one of my all-time favorite places to work is the La Brea Tar Pits. 
It's literally located smack dab in the middle of Los Angeles, where I'm from. Now, the great thing about it is it's been excavated for over 100 years. So there's tons and tons of fossils. You can see here, this is one hallway, and there's another hallway just like it. And each of these drawers is filled with numerous fossils. And it's not just any fossils that are found there. The great thing is we find tons of carnivores. So why is that? Well, if you're an herbivore and you get stuck in the tar, you essentially are gonna get trapped. Whether it's the moaning and groaning or your decaying smell, either way, you're gonna attract lots of carnivores to you. And they are subsequently gonna get stuck in the muck as well. And this actually creates a preservational bias in favor of the predators and carnivores. Typically, predators are fairly rare on the landscape, and there's fewer of them than there are herbivores, than there are plants. And this is known as the trophic pyramid. And typically, when we find fossils, we find them in proportion to the relative abundance on the landscape. So it's fairly rare to find carnivores. But at La Brea, we find tons, and there's a lot that we can learn from them. So what have we learned? Well, don't be a picky eater at least if you want to survive extinction. So we've studied this cougar, and this is the cougar here on this skull compared to the saber-toothed cat, so it's much smaller. It was really effective at eating smaller things. It could effectively hunt a rabbit. I like to see a saber-toothed cat do that. Uh, it could also scavenge and uh, eat carcasses. And this is really important because it's highly opportunistic, and it's less specialized than a lot of these large predators on the landscape. So we have the saber-toothed cat, we have the American cheetah, we even have the American lion. They were all likely specialized on much larger things. When the larger things went extinct, so did they. The other thing that we've learned from studying the survivors, the coyotes, is that they are also highly opportunistic. We know that they can eat small things and they can also scavenge. And in fact, coyotes will actually follow wolf packs around and scavenge on their carcasses that they leave behind. But what we learned from studying the fossils is that they didn't actually do this when they co-occurred with all of these large animals. In fact, they were likely the low, 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 low man on the totem pole. In fact, they couldn't get access to these carcasses and definitely couldn't defend them. Now, why does this matter? Well, this is really important because when we project out how animals are going to respond to changing climates, we make a fundamental assumption. And that is, what an animal does today, an animal will do tomorrow. That's called niche conservatism. But in this case, the coyote actually changed its ecology pretty dramatically in response to the extinction of a lot of these large carnivores. And that's important to think about and consider when projecting out how mammals will respond in the future. All right, so now back to one of my all-time favorite animals, the marsupial lion. It's also referred to as the killer wombat. And that's because it evolved from a herbivorous group of animals. But don't let that fool you. It was the fiercest pouch predator in all of Australia and probably could have eaten whatever it wanted. But when we study the chemistry of its teeth, we actually found that it was highly reliant and specialized on forest-dwelling prey. Because of its morphology as well, of its limbs, we also determined that it was likely using its limbs to sort of hunt from the treetops. So what's the problem? Well, in Australia, around 350,000 years ago, it became much drier. Forests began to open up, and their ability to hunt was likely diminished. So even though it has a bite force of 80% that of an African lion, it was no match for climate change. So why does it matter if it was climate change or humans that caused the extinction of these animals 10 to 35,000 years ago? Well, here's what I tell my students. If it was just humans, then presumably, if we stop hunting some of these humans. animals and we stop fragmenting the landscape, then many of these uh, animals will actually respond positively. But if, we, uh, if climate is even a small potential contributor to the extinctions of the animals in the past, but then we really need to think critically about this, especially as we're now living in a world in which human impacts and climate change are intermingled. It's also really important that we understand the effects of these large predator extinctions in the past, because these animals here, most of them, are endangered or threatened. If and when they go extinct, we need to understand the downstream consequences on the rest of those communities. So I love these bizarre beasts, and I really hope you do too, but at the very least, I hope that you've now gained an appreciation of the importance of the fossil record, especially for thinking about conservation. Thank you. <laughs>